In this video, we're going to look at preparing a bond investment using amortized cost, but we'll see what happens when we have an early sale. So we're not going to hold the bond to maturity. And we'll also see what happens when the bond pays out semi-annually instead of annually. So the best thing to do is first start off with our bond amortization table because that way then I'll know my journal entries will be correct. So I'll set the present value up. They did say that the present value is 74086, but again, I just want to prove this. So I'll go to formulas, go to financial, look for present value right here. So now the rate is the yield rate that we're using. And so in this case, the effective yield rate is 11%. But because we're paying this twice a year, I need to divide that rate by two. So then you'll see it's 0 0.055. Now with the number of payments, this bond to maturity is five years. It just says so right in the question. So then if you do five times two, because it's paying twice a year, that means there's 10 payments. So N per is payments. Now the payment amount is taking your face value of the bond, which is 80,000, and multiplying that by the stated or coupon rate of the bond. And that's the 9%. So that's the legal rate that the bond actually pays interest on to the bondholders. So when I do, 80,000 times 9%, I get 7,200, but then I have to divide that by two because it's paying out twice a year. Now the future value is the face value of the bond. So the bond is 80,000 and we'll just leave the type alone. So now I should get the 74086 and let me just see. I have 73,969. So that's why I always check the present value because that's actually a typo in the question. So it has to be 73,969. So I'll say okay. And let me just change this. In the question, 73. 969.90. There we go. And I'll prove that it's actually that. Otherwise, this amortization table isn't going to work. So I'm going to set up 10 payments. And the cash received will be the interest. So 80,000 times the interest at the bond rate or the stated rate. So that's 9%. So that's 7,200. But remember, this pays out twice a year. So the interest is actually going to be 3,600. So I'll just copy that all the way down. Now the interest income is going to be reported on our income statement at the effective rate. So I want to record the interest at 11%. So when I use the effective interest rate method, you just use the balance and then multiply that by the effective interest. And I should put that in here of 11%. And because this is paying out twice a year, I'm just going to divide that by two. So then the amortization is just going to be the difference between the two. So the interest and the cash. Now it doesn't matter if you put this as positive or negative. I'm just fixing my amortization table to make the ending balance what I want it to be. So I need this balance to go up to 80,000. So in this case, I'm going to add it. So I want this balance to keep going up. Now, instead of putting a formula in every single time on each line, I could just drag the formula down. But I just have to change this one because I always want it to take C9 on all of my formulas when I drag it down. So when you put a dollar sign in front of it, it just locks it. It just says, I'm always going to take 11%. I'm always going to take 11%. And now I can just highlight those and then drag it down. 
and hopefully it comes out to 80,000. So that's how I know that my bond amortization is correct because the carrying value is the present value, which we usually have to calculate. And then the face value is the future value. And that's the face value of the bond, 80,000. So this one's at a discount. And I already knew that because my market rate, just draw here. My market rate is higher than the, the stated rate of the bond. So in order to make this attractive for me to buy, in the end I am going to get 11%, but the way that I'm going to get it is 9% through my interest payments, and then me actually paying less for the bond at the beginning and then getting more back and then that makes it 11%, it's kind of neat. Okay, so let's start with the first journal entry. So on September 1st, I'm going to debit my bond investment at amortized cost, and that's going to be for my 73969.9. So that's me putting it on the books. And then I'll credit cash. And I'll just say to record purchase of bond investment. Okay, so the next step is I'm going to record my interest receivable because the problem is this first transaction doesn't happen until, let's see, September 1st is when I bought the bond. So if I'm buying it every six months, this one's going to happen, I'm going to count on my finger, September, October, November, December, January, February. So March 1st. So if I'm sitting at a December 31st year end, I actually have interest accrual from September, October, November, December. So that's four months that I have to deal with. So instead of recording cash, I'm going to record interest receivable. And what I'm going to do is take this payment, 3,600, and then just multiply that by four out of six months. So I'm four months into this six month bond and that will give me interest of 2,400. I'm going to do the same thing with recording my interest income. So I'm going to take this next uh, payment, 4068.34, and then I'm going to multiply that by four out of six months because I'm four months into a six month bond bond payment. So that's 2712.23. And then I'm going to debit my bond investment at amortized cost. So we could just take the difference. So to make this journal entry work, or you can just take your amortization and then multiply that by four out of six to give me 312.23. So this is just to record the interest accrual at the year end. But if this bond payment paid at December 31st, then this would actually just be the cash, interest income, and the bond investment that we would be recording. Okay, now what we should do is actually record this bond payment now. So let's say we're going into our next fiscal year end, and now it's March 1st. So what I need to do is debit my cash. So I am going to receive this 3,600. Then I'm going to debit my bond investment at amortized cost. So generally, it would be for that 468.34, but just remember we already debited four months worth in December. 
So I'm just going to subtract off the amount that I already took in December, and this will be the remaining two months. And then credit, interest receivable. So I just want to reverse this one out, the 2400. And then you can plug this one, or you can do credit, interest, income. And that would essentially be this 4068. But remember, we already took four months of that in the last year end, so we're just going to subtract out the 2712.23. And that would be to record the first interest payment. So now the question tells us that I guess we really didn't want to buy this bond for a very long time, which kind of goes against recording it using the effective interest rate method as amortized costs. We're assuming that we're going to hold the bond. But for this case, let's just assume that we decide on March 1st, after you receive the interest payment, we're going to sell the bond for $75,100. So right now, the carrying value of my bond is the 74438. So again, this happened right on March 1st, right after the first interest payment. We're going to record cash. So that's the market rate. And that was given to us, 75,100. And it's right here. And now I'm going to derecognize my bond. So I'll do credit, bond investment at amortized cost. And that's sitting on my books at 74438.24. Now it looks like I need to put it something on this side to balance that out. So if I go 75,100 minus the 74438, that gives me 661.76. So since it's a credit, it's going to be a gain. So I'll just say gain on disposal of investment. Uh, if it ended up being a debit that I had to balance it with, then I would just say loss on disposal of investment. And I'll just say to record the sale of bond. All right.